You know the first thing about sword fighting? Stick him with the pointy end. Ari just sort of stands out a bit. Her parents want her to be proper, but <laughs> she'd rather just be playing outside and wrestling with the boys, really. Where's Arya? She identifies with her father. He finds it quite amusing how she doesn't listen to what she's told. You do that song. I like to do my own thing, I guess. Some sisters don't get on very well. Arya! Arya thinks Sans is a little bit of an airhead. She's like royalty, and I look more like an urchin. Off with you. No begging. I'm not a beggar. I live here. Joffrey is not a very nice person, and Arya can see that. And she's angry with her sister because she finds him so adoring and such a nice person, and he's not. Deep down, he's evil. Arya and my brother have a close relationship. John can identify with Arya a lot more because she's a bit different, and he's a bit different. This is no toy. She knows that it's hard for him, so she wants to treat him the same as everyone else. Careful. And he gives her a sword, and so a dream come true. I almost feel a lot more powerful. The lady shouldn't play with swords. I don't want to be a lady. He wants her to keep it, but he wants her to know how to use it. <gasps> Ned wants her to be normal, but deep down, he wants her to let loose. Brandon, I want you to promise me no more climbing. I promise. I'm Isaac Kempstead Wright and I play Brand Stark. Well, he's sort of, he lives quite an easy life to start with. He loves climbing, he's the son of a lord. He has quite a good relationship with his father. In the first part of the episode, he has to go to his first beheading and his father's trying to teach him about it. You understand why I did it? John said he was a deserter. But do you understand why I had to kill him? Now oh, where's the old way? The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. They're on their way back from this execution and um, they find this dead direwolf and there are like five puppies. Jon Snow manages to convince Ned that it's an omen. It's meant to happen. Don't stop. There are five pups. One for each of the Stark children. The direwolf is a sigil of your house. We were meant to have them. The sigil of House Stark is a direwolf, and there's five, one for each of the children. The name of Brown's direwolf is Summer. It's such a great story. It's really, like, action-packed. It's really cool. So sorry, my love. My name is Michelle Fairley, and I play Catelyn Stark. She's a good mother, a devoted wife. Her relationship with Ned, it is a very genuine, true marriage. She respects him enormously, but she also sees him as a human being. I have no choice. That's what men always say when honor calls. You do have a choice. They have children, and that is a very big priority to her. All the Stark children have a thread of commonality, but they also have incredibly individual characters as well. They're just a lovely contrast. She does not agree with war, but she becomes a warrior. She is a woman, but she is learning to think like a man. She does not know that she's about to set off on this journey, and that's the way it happens. Essentially, it's about people caring, fighting, loving, hating. It's all about that clash of morals and respects and lands and traditions. It's wonderful. I absolutely love it. Everyone who isn't us is an enemy. She's very politically minded and paranoid. She's trying very hard to keep it together and she seems very in control. And underneath, everything's completely falling apart. As your brother, I feel it's my duty to warn you. You worry too much. And you never worry about anything. Her quest is to stay in control, no matter 
what that means to her or anyone else. Start the damn joust before I piss myself. Cersei really loved Robert in the beginning and thought that they could make it work, but right now it's pretty hateful. Don't you get tired? Every day. How long can hate hold a thing together? Well, 17 years is quite a long time. She keeps it all behind closed doors and, and lets only those know who she trusts. <coughs> she loves her brother, but she'll trust him and she'll stay with him as long as he's faithful and loyal to her politics. Jamie's more fearful than Cersei, and I think Cersei and Tyrion have a lot more in common. The charms of the North seem entirely lost on you. I still can't believe you're going. It's ridiculous, even for you. You wound me. You know how much I love my family. Tyrion is as wily as she is, if not more so. And so I think she's very threatened by his manipulation and his planning, as she does. They both, they kind of mirror each other a little bit, I think, in their knowledge. But you are a beauty. I don't think there's any love for Sansa. I hear we might share a grandchild. I hear the same. Your daughter will do well in the capital. It's another step of power if she can join these two families. But she knows that Sansa's father, Ned's a threat, especially when he gets close to Robert and he finds out certain things about her that, that she obviously can't afford to let him make public. You're just a soldier, aren't you? I was also trained to kill my enemies, Your Grace. As was I. He possesses qualities that she just doesn't. There's a kind of secret admiration going on for Ned, but she does what she does. Tell them to stop. You want the entire horde to stop? For how long? Until I command them otherwise. You're learning to talk like a queen. Not a queen. A Khaleesi. I'm Amelia Clark, and I'm playing Daenerys. She goes on such a journey. She's an incredibly strong, powerful woman who doesn't quite come into her own until much later on. She is the blood of the dragon. Our family's symbol is the dragons, and they haven't been around for quite some time, but the myths and the legends that go along with our family is all centered around the dragons. I think that there's always this essence of that within her that she doesn't quite realize until the moment of her wedding when she gets presented with the dragon eggs and there's this connection she can't quite explain. It blossoms into that being what gives her her strength, and that's what she goes back into every time. That's like where her resolve is. She has a bizarre relationship with her brother and there is this kind of underlining sexual thing going on. It's kind of like, I'm his property, so that's how he sees it. And so he gets us into this situation where he decides to marry me off. He uses me as a pawn to try and get what he wants. When they write the history of my reign, sweet sister, they will say it began today. The wedding starts off with we have the presentation ceremony. I get to stand and Khal Drogo takes a good look, decides that he likes me, so then that's it, I'm gonna get married. Where's he going? The ceremony is over. But he didn't say anything, did he, did he like her? Trust me, Your Grace. If he didn't like her, we'd know. He's this huge, huge, formidable creature that she's completely and utterly petrified of and she doesn't know if she can deal with the situation. And so it comes to the wedding and it's a baptism by fire for me being introduced to his culture basically. So there's death and there's sex and there's violence, there's blood and guts and these foods that she's never experienced or tried and this whole other world that she's just been thrown into. Are you from my country? So draw a moment of Bear Island. I served your father for many years. Jorah teaches her the Dothraki ways. He's kind and he takes care of her. He's, he's an incredibly, incredibly important person to Danny, but he helps to give her strength. Every time she wavers, he's there. Every time she's kind of unsure about something, he's there and he helps to just make her stronger and stronger. And I think she really trusts him. What do you pray for, Sir Jorah? Home. I pray for home too. It's just the best story, because at the heart of it, it's fascinating, and there's so many twists and turns. And when you think you've got it figured, it completely changes its mind. <laughs> there's real emotion, and there's real relationships that you can understand and relate to, and you feel for them when they die. And there's the magic as well. It's just brilliant. It's a wonderful story. It's a strange thing, the first time you cut a man. Realize we're nothing but sacks of meat and blood and some bone to keep it all standing.
I'm Nikolai Costa-Walder. I play Jaime Lannister. Game of Thrones, as it says in the title, is about the game you play for power. These families that all fight for the power of, of the country. The Lannisters that are the most powerful family, the richest family. Then you have the Baratheons. Robert Baratheon is the king, married to Cersei Lannister, who's the queen, so the Lannisters have a lot of power. My character, Jaime Lannister, and you know, you see him first, you think that's just, he's evil. And then as you dive into the story, you realize, well, maybe he's, it's not just black and white. There are more shades to it. He's a member of the King's Guard. He's like the bodyguard to the king. He's also known as the King Slayer. King Slayer! Get in here! Because he killed, assassinated the previous king. When I watched the Mad King die, I remembered him laughing as your father burned. It felt like justice. Is that what you tell yourself at night? This previous king was evil, but there's this code of honor that he broke. He finds it difficult to accept that people just don't thank him in a way. On top of that, he has a very uh, special relationship to his sister. She's the queen, and it's very complicated. I think he depends on her. She's kind of the only one who really knows him and accepts him, and he loves his brother. Little brother. Beloved siblings. You don't really see Jamie having fun with anyone but you see him having fun with Tyrion. They, they have a very dry wit. Don't leave me alone with these people. I'm sorry, I've begun the feast a bit early, and this is the first of many courses. I thought you might say that, but since we're short on time. <laughs> see you at sundown. <laughs> Close the door! He is a soldier, and he doesn't care about the politics. He understands it, and he knows how to you know, maneuver in that world. You should be the hand of the king. It's not that I can do without. The days are too long. The lives are too short. He knows the game, and he does not want to be directly involved in it. Do you think Ned Stark's bastard bleeds like the rest of us? Well, Lord Snow, it appears you're the least useless person here. My name's Kit Harrington and I play Jon Snow. I think Game of Thrones is different from anything that's been done. In lots of things nowadays, you have black and white, you have good and bad. And this is brilliant because no one's totally evil or totally good. I would say Jon Snow is quite close to being that good person. He's always had to take the back foot in the Stark family. He's a byproduct of Ned's infidelity but he's always got on very well with his brothers and sisters and his father. You might not have my name, but you have my blood. There's a hell of a lot of inner turmoil. He's fighting between his ambition to be someone and, and to make a mark on things and his reality being an illegitimate child. It's Rob that's going to be the natural leader and is the heir to the throne. He has to vent his clear leadership qualities somewhere else. That's why he goes to the Night's Watch. The Night's Watch is a band of men who are at the edge of this world and want no part of the politics that goes on within the Seven Kingdoms. All of these people are sent to try and redeem themselves. It's essentially a kind of Alcatraz. I don't think John does expect what he gets when he gets to the wall, and it's a really hard lesson for him to learn. He glorified this place in his head, and he gets there and he finds it's a dirty, half-built castle surrounded by people very unlike his family in the background he grew up in. He realises quite quickly that everyone at the wall is equal and that he won't get anywhere unless he accepts that fact first and becomes a brother. Mama, where are you? What's he saying? He says yes. Paul Drogo is a savage beast. He's a lion mixed with a silverback. He's never lost a battle, and whoever's got the longest hair is the, the biggest pimp, so I've got the longest. It's Carl Drogo. He said he has 100,000 men in his horde. A Targaryen boy crosses with a Dothraki horde at his back. The scum will join him. The Dothraki, very free, tribal, beautiful, loving. Maybe not too loving, eh? His wife comes to him as a gift, and he slowly falls in love with her, you know. She just really shows me a world that I've never seen before. Little by little, you just see him warm up.
I, Eddard, of the House Stork, sentence you to die. Ned Stark is known as the Lord of Winterfell, which is the northern section of the Seven Kingdoms. He's a loyal man, a very decisive man, especially loyal towards the king and, uh, and, and, and his family. Ned's wife, Catelyn, and uh, children. Don't get into trouble. They have a very strong relationship. <laughs> and which one of you was a marksman at ten? So they're all right, you know, they're quite, they're quite settled. But there's always a tension when Jon Snow is around. Because he's my bastard son, I love the boy, but I can't show him too much emotion in front of my wife because she feels very resentful. That's their way of life. And uh, all of a sudden it's changed by this request from the king. I need you, Ned. We were meant to rule together. The king is the only man I can trust. He's more like a brother than his own brothers were. You're too fat for your armor. Is that how you speak to your king? And I trust him, and that's why I decided to become his right-hand man. You're a loyal friend. The last one I've got. I know what I'm putting you through. Thank you for saying yes. It's quite heart-wrenching for Ned to leave his family. I have no choice. That's what men always say when honour goes. He loves his wife very dearly. Uh, he needs her. That's why he feels unsettled about leaving her behind. Half of the family stay in Winterfell and half of the family go down to King's Landing. A very disturbing kind of world, a pit of snakes really, where these very corrupt people are gaining more and more power, all with their own agenda. Chris, Robert's wife, Cersei, doesn't want him there. No, nobody wants him there. What are you doing here? I might ask the same of you. What is it you hope to accomplish? He's nosing around, he's trying to find things out, looking into their affairs and finding you know, skeletons in the cupboard. Are you telling me the Crown is three million in debt? I am telling you the Crown is six million in debt. This is foolishness. He realises he's got to make some kind of ally to survive in this particular environment, so he does with little finger. Very powerful man. You're a funny man. You can't just be honest and honourable in this society. It just doesn't work. And he'd rather die than lose his honour, his loyalty and his sense of duty. Baelish, perhaps I was wrong to distrust you. Distrusting me was the wisest thing you've done since you climbed off your horse. Littlefinger is a uh, player in the court of King Robert Baratheon. We are the lords of small matters here. I've got my finger in a few other pies as well. Brothels make a much better investment than ships, I've found. Whores rarely sink. He's a schemer, dreamer double-crosser with a steadfast resolution never to be bettered. Everyone's well aware of your enduring fondness for Lord Stark's wife. Littlefinger has been and remains uh, obsessed with Catelyn. She treats me like a little brother. You're a true friend. Don't tell anyone. I have a reputation to maintain. Although I bear it well, it does not sit that well with me. Ned Stark's earnest and so righteous. You have my thanks as well. Now there's a prize. I like them, but I keep good with quite a lot of parties. Generally, I'm looking after number one. I have not had the pleasure, my lord. Littlefinger is interested in Sansa because she's uh, Catelyn's daughter. She reminds me of Catelyn when she was younger. I won't tell anyone, I promise. No, please don't. Things in King's Landing or in the whole of the Seven Kingdoms are rolling towards you know possible civil war but Littlefinger thrives in times of chaos or of disquiet that's when I'm at my sharpest and at my best and having fun I'm not your boy Lannister I'm Lord of Winterfell while my father is away then you might learn a lord's courtesy Rob Stark is a boy who has to learn very quickly how to be a man and to be a leader. Relax your bow arm. Rob looks after Bran a lot. <laughs> he knows how hard it is to be a young man in a Stark family. And he's bound by duty and 
and honour a lot of this which comes from his dad. Rob looks up to Ned so much and watches him and watches how he is around his men and around his family and how he disciplines people. He has to put on a mask of being a man and being capable because there's too many people that are going to be looking to him for answers and for leadership. We need a new steward and there are several other appointments that require our immediate attention. I don't care about appointments. I'll make the appointments. His dad goes, I have to rule Winterfell. He's gone from being a boy that's growing up quite quickly to having to be a man and leading armies and making decisions and killing people. I'll ride to King's Landing. No, there must always be a stock in Winterfell. My mum's starting to see that she might have lost her boy a bit. He's had to grow up quickly. Jon Snow and Rob Stark have a fantastic relationship. Next time I see you, you'll be all in black. It was always my colour. They've grown up together as brothers and they've dealt with everything together and especially in a world where men don't share their emotions and don't talk to each other. And it's just like that's when he would need John the most and he loses John. He loses his support. It's not easy being a Stark male. You've got to live up to a lot of things and you've got to grow up very, very quickly. He doesn't have a choice when it comes to it. He's got to do it. So he will do it. We're Starks and that's what we do. Grace, you got fat. <laughs> My name's Mark Abbey and I play King Robert Baratheon. Game of Thrones is about a land called Westeros, which is a fantasy world, but where a series of families are fighting for power, and it's really about the politics of that. Robert was primarily a warrior and didn't inherit his crown, he fought for it and won it. In the years since he became sovereign, he's really had no challenges to his position, so he's grown a little bit lazy, he enjoys a drink and hunting and uh, doing all the fun things in life, really. I'm trying to get you to run my kingdom while I eat, drink and haul my way to an early grave. Robert is married to Cersei Lannister in the tradition of royal marriages for building power. By linking a powerful house with another powerful house, you create a much more powerful dynasty. It's a marriage in name, but not a happy marriage in any stretch of the imagination. The love of Robert's life is not his wife. It's actually Ned's sister, who is now dead, and he's never got over there. Did you have to bury her in a place like this? This is where she belongs. She belonged with me. Robert and Ned grew up together, and Ned was gifted Winterfell when uh, Robert took his place at King's Landing. Robert has discovered that he's surrounded himself with people who may not have the best of intentions for him. He needs somebody to be his right-hand man. Ned is really the only person he can trust. I only ask you because I need you. You're a loyal friend. You hear me? A loyal friend. The last one I've got. I hope I'll serve you well. You will. Yes, he's a king, but he's not the kind of king that you would expect to see. He wasn't somebody who was born to be king. He's a fighting man and a working man who's won his crown. And he's really more down with the drinking, the girls, and everything else that, that, that gets you. So he's not really keeping an eye on the bigger picture. Do you think Joffrey will like me? When would we be married? Soon, or do we have to wait? Hush now. Your father hasn't even said yes. Please, please. It's the only thing I ever wanted. I'm Sophie Turner, and I play Sansa Stark. Sansa has a very independent view of the world because she's very unaware of what happens. She's the sort of girl that believes in princes and when her prince is going to come and take her on the horse and ride away into the moonlight and things like that. She's not so close to her father. She's more her mother's side. She loves her father so much, but I just think she doesn't show it as much as Arya does. She thinks that's not the queenly thing to do. 
She wants to be queen, of course. Her parents are already planning for her to get married to Joffrey. Sansa's already attracted to him immediately, the first time she sees him. She doesn't really care how his personality is right now because he's just so good looking and attractive that she just falls madly in love with him. <laughs> Sansa's relationship with her sister Arya is a bit of a love-hate relationship. Arya! But I think that Sansa just disapproves of the things that Arya does. Arya dresses in dirty clothes. Sometimes she wears trousers, whereas Sansa's like, dresses, dresses, dresses. She has to look beautiful all the time. Not only is it a period drama, but it's also fantasy. And I find that really fascinating because it never happens in this world. Nothing like this happens. It stands out from all the other medieval dramas that are around. Starks are feasting us at sundown. Don't leave me alone with these people. I'm sorry. I've begun the feast a bit early. And this is the first of many courses. Tyrion is sort of the, the good bad guy, the bad good guy. You might as well kill me here. I am not a murderer, Lannister. Neither am I. He has zero powers with sword or physical defenses. <laughs> So he has to defend himself with his uh, wit and charm. How do you think Balin Greyjoy would feel if you could see his only surviving son has turned lackey? <laughs> Careful, imp. I've offended you. Forgive me. It's been a rough morning. Often time that works better than the sword. Look at me and tell me what you see. Is this a trick? What you see is a dwarf. If I had been born a peasant, they might have left me out in the woods to die. He likes playing with people's expectations of his size as well. He knows exactly who he is. What's your story, bastard? Ask me nicely and maybe I'll tell you, Dwarf. Tyrion and Jon Snow have a common ground with each other. He is considered the bastard of his family and I'm considered the bastard of mine, even though I'm of the same gene code. Little brother, beloved siblings. Tyrion and Cersei both have a hard time being around each other. They see each other for who they really are. No, I just want to stand on top of the wall and piss off the edge of the world. <laughs> Children don't need to hear your filth. Tyrion and his brother Jaime have a close connection because of the horrible things that they've been through together. My dear brother, there are times you make me wonder whose side you're on. My dear brother, you wound me. You know how much I love my family. Jaime has gotten out of many tragic situations in the past. They have a real loyalty to each other. Tyrion has a lot of faults, but he's not one for lying. He sleeps well at the end of the day. <laughs> See you at sundown. <laughs> Close the door! I need you to be perfect today. Can you do that for me? You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Viserys Targaryen is the true king of Westeros and he's been in exile his whole life and he's trying to get back to where he feels he belongs and he will do pretty much whatever that takes. Your Grace. Yes, my dear. They call you the last dragon. They do. Being the last dragon, he carries a huge burden which he has all his life on his own and when he can't take it, something just snaps. You dare. You give commands to me. Have you forgotten who you are? Look at you! He's looked after his sister on his own for her whole life. He still sees her as this little sullen child. He doesn't realize that Daenerys turned into an adult when he wasn't looking. His relationship with his sister is, is going through a massive change. That suddenly, he needs her to do something for him. Where for the whole, whole life, he's done everything for her. In that, he's trying to marry her to Khal Drogo. The Dothraki are a tribal nomadic race of people and they are based very much around horses in terms of what they eat and how they travel and what they worship. Viserys doesn't have any experience or real understanding or knowledge of the Dothraki people. He just sees them in terms of their numbers and Khal Drogo just in terms of a warrior, not as a person. These are my people now. You shouldn't call them savages. I'll call them what I like because they're my people. This is my army. The Dothraki are a fascinating, rich, powerful people with their own customs and they don't care two heaps about his traditions and his family and his right to rule. 
he sees himself as their king now, and they don't treat him like that. He just refuses to adapt and change because he doesn't see their worth. So draw a moment of Bear Island. I served your father for many years. Gods be good, I hope to will serve the rightful king. So Jura Mormont is the knight in exile. I see him as a useful ally, and I love the fact that it's the first man, the first grown man, to actually call me your grace and to uh, treat me like a king. But everything is subordinate to this higher purpose of his, any human relationships, even with my little sister. Make him happy. He wouldn't save her, he wouldn't save anyone, if it meant getting the crown. <laughs>